there got a thumbs up. Good evening and uh, welcome to our occasional lecture debate discussion series. We have this every couple of years, usually when there's an issue, an economic issue of note, and uh, we are having an economic issue of note right now. Um, there was a uh, 19th century German economist who proposed that government tends to grow as society gets wealthier. And um, it's easy to find evidence for that. In 1900, uh, the country paid 2% of GDP in taxes to the government. And of course, we were a lot poorer in the year 2000 when we were paying about 20% of taxes to the government. When we were a lot wealthier. Uh, it's known as Wagner's Law. And the topic tonight, uh, the title, uh, was, uh, let's see if I can call it right, I think it was spending, um, investment, and budget deficit, sequestration. Okay, so when you hear the word spending, um, as in spend until you drop, um, there's an implication of waste. When you hear investment, uh, the implication usually is that you're doing something for the future. And sequestration, in case uh, you're not familiar with the term by now, is the case when government is going to cut spending um, well, with a mean axe approach. About uh, 85 billion will be cut out of government budget for the coming year uh, across the board. And um, that's a concern. Um, it's going to affect all of us. Okay. <clears throat> when we teach economics, um, all our textbooks start with how societies answer the economic problem of scarcity. Uh, we have the traditional method of command, and we have this market system. And our textbooks are really about the market system. And the market, like the other two systems, address the issue of what gets produced, how it gets produced, and who gets it. And I think there's something wrong with the textbooks because the implication, well, who gets it is the people who have the money and have a taste for the product. And um, that's a bit disingenuous because the truth of the matter is that who gets it is, to a great extent, a political decision. And that's what the arguments have been in Congress between Democrats and Republicans. This is really not just an economic issue, but it's also a political issue. So what we have with us tonight is we have uh, three economists, uh, let me introduce them, Thomas Gasson, uh, who is the publisher, editor, creator of um, Forecast and Strategies, a economic newsletter with hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Um, he's been a professor here at Rollins at Columbia Business School at Mercer College. He's also teaching at Sing Sing right now at Venture in New York. Um, he was a CI analyst at one time, and I think he's written over 25 books. Um, we also have Dr. Tom Rock, which many of you know. Um, so I'll keep it shorter. <laughs> uh, and we have Dr. Schultz um, from the Economics Department. And um, Dr. Skousen will present an economic slash political perspective of a libertarian, Austrian, neoclassical, mostly neoclassical, I think, approach to the issues at play. Um, Dr. Rock will present a liberal political perspective, and Dr. Choice will present um, a more radical economic political perspective. And what we're thinking is that each will go for about, for about 15 minutes, and um, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, and uh, perhaps I will try to end it in a more optimistic note. 
So, uh, would you like to have the primacy or the recency of that? First or last? Uh, I'll go first. Okay. Uh, I should say that I, I, Dr. Skousen is a bit out of room here tonight, so let's take more attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Harry. It's a pleasure to be back at Rollins. I taught here for about 15 or 16 years as an adjunct. I've always had one foot in the in the academic world, I have a PhD in economics, in monetary economics, uh, but I also am a firm believer in applied economics, so I write an investment newsletter and I have copies in the back for any of you who get one. I've written 25 books. Uh, my most popular book in the academic world is The Making of Modern Economics, which is a history of thought book published by Amy Sharp, and it uh, was recently rated the number one uh, textbook now in uh, history of thought, so uh, I'm very proud of this book, uh, and uh, it's now in its uh, second edition and through uh, a number of printings. What I'd like to do today is, is just uh, list uh, four of uh, what I think are serious economic problems, and I want to emphasize the serious nature of this. If any of your teachers at Rollins College suggest that everything is fine and there aren't any serious problems that we're headed for, uh, then, then you're getting bad advice because uh, I think there are very serious problems that this uh, country is faced now. If you look at my newsletter, I'm really quite bullish right now and have been since the 2008 crisis. Uh, but the stock market and the economy and where we're headed are two different things and the stock market can, can uh, go from a bull to a bear market rather quickly. So one of the four areas that I see as serious problems, one is the the, um, what appears to be a secular, uh, slow growth economy in the United States. Not in the rest of the world, but in the United States. We used to grow at 3 or 4% rate, now we're growing at 1 to 2% rate, and there's no evidence that I can see that we're, we're really uh, breaking out of that. Uh, second is the, a, a much more serious problem, I guess they're connected, is the high unemployment rate and, and number of discouraged workers. The official government rate of 7.9% does not include discouraged workers who have given up. If you include those, some estimates uh, have it over 20%. Over 20% of Americans want jobs uh, but have either given up or haven't found a job. And that's just unacceptable. And that's a crisis, a serious crisis. Uh, students, 40 to 50% of students cannot find a job after graduation. Uh, that's a disgrace in this country when we're training our students to learn things. This is something that you all have to face. Uh, number three, there are way too many people on welfare. Our welfare system is a very destructive influence in this country. Uh, I live very close to Yonkers. Our church is very much involved with people in Yonkers. And we have fourth generation people on welfare. And they don't even like it themselves. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's, it's very discouraging because they have to give up so much to find a job, which is going to be rewarding. Uh, there are 47.7 million Americans on food stamps, today's soup kitchen. Uh, this is unacceptable. And we're developing a benefit-corrupted society. Uh, the makers and the takers, we're, we're a very divisive society, and it's getting worse. So the inequality issue, I think, is a very serious one. And number four is our future liability problem. Skyrocketing national debt. The national debt now exceeds GDP. It's at $16 trillion. And uh, then the unfunded liability problem of Social Security and Medicare has been estimated to be anywhere between $85 and $130 trillion. It's really hard to figure out just what it is, but it is substantial. It's a very serious problem as the baby boomers retire, and uh, I think it's something that we have to address. So, um, uh, I think uh, the United States is in decline because we have rejected a lot of the principles of sound economics. I'd like to quote Harold Bloom, the famed literary critic at Yale and recently warned, 21st century America is in a state of decline. It is scary to reread the final volume of Gibbon these days because the fate of the Roman Empire seems to continue even now. We have approached bankruptcy, foreign wars we cannot pay for, and defrauding our urban and rural poor. We have no Emerson or Whitman among us. And what he's basically saying is we lack leadership in this country 
who are really willing to take the hard choices that are necessary to reverse uh, uh, and deal with these, these uh, four main problems. So what I would like to suggest, and, and let me just first say that there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, I think it's uh, important that we focus on um, real solutions uh, without resorting to political labels or even schools of thought or other diverse, uh, divisive terminology. Uh, I, I'm personally sick and tired of every the name calling that is going on in this country and where uh, you're, you're a jerk, you're an idiot. You, the stuff that you see on Fox News and MSNBC where people get into shouting matches, uh, let's have a civil discussion uh, on real solutions, solutions that actually work. And I'm hoping that uh, in this discussion uh, with diverse backgrounds that we can come to an agreement about some of the ways to, to deal with these problems. Um, so that's what I would like to see because if economics is a science, then, then we should be able to uh, solve these problems. Like you know, what's the best way to drive a car? Well, it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat or liberal or conservative or left wing or right wing, it's the right way and the wrong way to drive a car. And, and so that, that's the way I would like to see us uh, approach uh, this, this uh, issue. Um, uh, Jefferson said uh, we should pursue, uh, uh, that, that our society should be one uh, where we pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, uh, you know, the question is, are we, are we doing that? Uh, are, are we supporting life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Or are we losing our liberties? Uh, is, is our happiness in decline uh, as individuals? Uh, now, to introduce my recommendation, so I'd like to quickly go through a list of uh, seven or eight of uh, my recommendations, how I think we could improve uh, and re resolve these issues. They're not going to be resolved overnight, but over time, I think good policies, uh, it's not conservative, liberal, or anything like that. It's just good policies. What works is what I'd like to focus on. So Adam Smith, the founder of Modern Economics, said, little else is required for a nation or a state to reach the highest level of opulence, the highest standard of living. And he listed four things. They are as follows for any of you who are taking notes. Peace, easy taxes, sound money, and a tolerable administration of justice. I mean, that's a very simple formula, in my opinion, to what it would take to get us back on track as a country. So, do we have peace? Do we have easy taxes? Do we have sound money? And do we have a tolerable administration of justice? That's the kind of questions that we need to answer. So, first of all, my, my number one recommendation is we need to promote a stronger private sector. I believe business... The private sector is the key to economic recovery, not grandiose government programs to hire workers and so on. We need more private companies hiring workers. To me, and, and, uh, and using their, and increasing their profitability and, and using that money for, for uh, expanding uh, business. Uh, and so, how can we do that? Well, I think we need to improve the business environment. And government has a very important role in there. But it's not just government. It's also identifying new business management techniques. And the business schools are really working on this. I'm, I'm a very close friend with John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods Market. And I encourage all of you to read his book, Conscious Capitalism, that just came out. This is going to revolutionize how business behaves towards workers, suppliers, customers, because he has a stakeholder philosophy rather than the old traditional shareholder philosophy. This is very powerful. But government can do its role too, and Mackey has been very critical of government policy in, um, in intervening too much in the uh, process of where uh, business should be. So, for example, I think tax credits for employment is much better than imposing a minimum wage law. Um, I, I think we need to cut the corporate tax rate uh, and to encourage uh, uh, 
business so that it stays here in the United States rather than going outside the United States. In fact, I would favor a, a simple flat tax that you can put on a postcard. Yes, that would eliminate a lot of draw, jobs of accountants and tax attorneys, but that's a good thing. And they, they are, they're educated, they can find uh, more worthwhile uh, work. But I, I spend thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars every year to my tax accounts on my Skousen Publishing Company, my Freedom Fest, my individual tax returns, thousands of dollars. It's a total waste if we had a simplified flat tax system that is all the rage in Eastern Europe and Hong Kong and many other uh, places that are doing well. So I'd like to see like an 18% flat tax on corporate rates, capital gains, dividends, follow the Hong Kong example there. I'd like to see health savings accounts as Mackey has recommended in, in Whole Foods and many other uh, companies rather than Obamacare, which I think is a disaster. And, uh, you know, uh, Charlie has brought charts. I should show you the chart. There's an incredible chart, you can Google this, uh, number of pages to explain Medicare. Number of pages. And it's going like this, it's turning hyperbolic. And it, uh, businesses are struggling with the bureaucracy that you're, you're seeing. Uh, so that's my next recommendation, to streamline business regulation. Sarbox and Dobbs Frank were went way overboard in their regulation and they need to be paired back, especially Sarbanes-Oxley, which destroyed the IPO market in the United States. Many companies have gone, gone abroad in that respect. And I think, I think austerity is the name of the game. I don't think uh, we, can, we can have big arguments about austerity, but all this, virtually most of the states have had to adopt austerity, because the federal government has chosen not to. And, uh, and by the way, this whole, this whole thing about an $85 uh, billion dollar decline, that is not an actual decline. It's an actual increase from last year's 2012 budget. Uh, it, it's, it's just pulling it back a little bit. So there's a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of uh, scary tactics being used there that I don't think is very helpful at all. Um, anyway, I think there could be tremendous cutbacks in defense spending. I think. Our war economy is way out of line. We need to bring a lot of troops home. Uh, I, I think uh, Rand Paul has some very good ideas in, in that regard. So defense, I mean, th there's just no defense for the amount of spending on war that we do in this country. Uh, the Department of Education should be abolished. I can't tell you how many problems have been created by the Department of Education at Mercy College where my wife and I teach. She is the, in charge of the Learning Center, and she spends half of her time dealing with these insane rules from the, from the No Child Left Behind and all this Department of Education nonsense that, that goes on. I mean, it's just a crime what is going on in the education in this country. And can anyone explain how you can see any improvement in the education in this country with the department, the Federal Department of Education it has spent over a trillion dollars now by some estimates since it got started. Uh, I, think, I think it's a travesty. Uh, and then of course there's many government agencies that I think could be cut back sharply as well. I believe a balanced budget amendment is essential because even when you have full employment, the Keynesian model is that you uh, should run surpluses. But did we? Uh, only Bill Clinton uh, uh, and, and a Republican Congress was able to put together a surplus. I mean, G George Bush was a disaster in this country in terms of uh, trying to uh, uh, balance. We should have had a balanced budget because we had full employment during, largely during the entire eight years. I think we should have means testing for Social Security and Medicare as a short-term solution. But the long-term solution is to convert Social Security to a defined contribution plan. Major corporations have all had to do this, to switch from defined benefit to defined contribution plans. The, the business solves problems. The problem with government is that they just delay trying to solve problems. And it's a great tragedy in this country. And then finally, a stable monetary uh, policy. Uh, and we can discuss, we can have a debate on what uh, stable monetary policy means. But I don't think, I think most people would agree that the Federal Reserve has been anything but stable over the last 30 or 40 years. We're celebrating the 100th, or, or 
uh, honoring the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve and uh, the, the instability that the Federal Reserve has caused over the years is mind-boggling. Um, so I will end by uh, uh, quoting Ben Franklin, uh, who I think had some wise things to say. He said, first of all, the policy of America should be commerce with all and war with none. It's idealistic, but it's something we should work for. And then finally he said, a virtuous and industrious people may be cheaply governed. So do we have cheap government? And does anybody in this room think that government is cheap? No, it's expensive. I mean, it's really expensive. And it's, un and, and it's unfortunate in that regard. But what does that say about us as a virtuous and industrious people? Are we a virtuous and industrious people? Well, if we are, we can be cheaply governed. So I end with that quote, which I think is an optimistic view. I am going to talk <coughs> about some countries that I think have adopted many of these policies and been successful, but I'll wait until after... Looks like Charlie has some uh, list of, of uh, countries that he's going to be talking about, and we can discuss that at that point. Thank you very much. Well, I, I thought this debate was about uh, austerity versus an alternative, and I guess you described some austerity there, you didn't really get into the macro aspect of it as I hoped, but uh, let me just define austerity as a program basically to uh, reduce government spending and uh, normally uh, to increase taxation. Uh, there's a variety of other things too that the European countries that are engaged in are doing that selling off parts of the national patrimony, privatizing things. Um, they pass laws that restrict workers from getting wage increases. Uh, they've made it easier to fire workers and a variety of other pieces of the program too that's associated, I think, with your position. So uh, anyway, I was going to look at uh, austerity. And so I just wanted to show some data and then I'll address some of uh, Mark's um, Proposals, uh, perhaps later, but let me just see if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, okay, I got to work. Um, this is a nice little graph that shows uh, the previous uh, recessions, post World War II recessions. Um, and uh, this is kind of the uh, recession that we call now a variety of names, but for some reason the economists have called it uh, in the literature, they're now calling it the Great Recession. <laughs> Okay, it's not just a normal recession, it's a great recession. And the reason why is we didn't have negative growth for long enough to maybe call it a depression. Um, but in any case, uh, you can see to some extent this is the job losses that have occurred, and to some extent the uh, beginning to climb back up this red, but it's a much more severe uh, crisis than we've had before. It, uh, for a couple weeks in October, September, October 2008, effectively the financial system shut down there. Pardon? That's a cool chart, I like that. Yeah. Uh, you can have it when I'm finished with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't charge you anything for it. Uh, but maybe I uh, will trade you for your newsletter, which I hear is quite expensive. <laughs> Okay, and uh, this just looks at unemployment and some other things. I'm going to breeze through this just to catch the highlights because I want to get to uh, some actual numbers. This is just a U.S. <coughs> chart here, a variety of stuff, but I want to actually get to the numbers. I was trying to turn this into, uh, yeah, this is the one I want for the moment. Uh, if you look at these four countries right here, these are the ones, the most famous austerity countries in uh, the Eurozone. The Eurozone is the 17 countries of the European uh, Monetary Union. And uh, they're not exactly countries anymore because they don't have their own currency, so there's some difficulties in comparing. As I say, Greece can be like Alabama, but it can't be like America because we have our own currency still. Greece does not. Uh, likewise, these others, they all have opted for the Euro, which is run by a central bank. So they, in some sense, they brought together these 17 countries into a monetary union, but they forgot that capitalism uh, has ups and downs, and so when you have a major down, 
the usual remedy has been to use government fiscal policy, spending or taxing, to try to, in some sense, put more purchasing power in the economy. But if you look at, uh, since 2008, uh, the unemployment rate in Spain is now 26%, 55% for 25 and under, uh, Portugal 16, Ireland uh, just under 15, Ireland's improving, it's uh, come down from 15, and uh, nearly 27% in Greece uh, three or four months ago. Uh, you don't see some of this in the other areas, but you uh, do see some, uh, in some sense, usually a drop here in 2009, because what happened in Europe was basically unemployment declined like here in the States for the whole European Union, and then it started going back up, but now it looks like it's going back down again, so there's some sort of uh, possible double, as they call it, double dip recession. Uh, but uh, in some sense, austerity is a program that ensures that unemployment will rise. So we're going to see some modest austerity because of the tax increases we had January 1st. It's going to be about 1.4% 1, 1 less spending going into the economy because all of us who work uh, now have to again start paying uh, for our entitlement taxes for Social Security and Medicare that were abated for three years. So we didn't have to pay those, but now we do. And so therefore everybody's got one or two percent less income to spend. And uh, this uh, reduction in spending is uh, economists, we deflate money values into real terms. Uh, so to some extent, that's why you can argue we're never cutting, we're always spending more, we're spending more dollars, but in fact, in real purchasing power, we're spending uh, a cut in real terms. <coughs> This is, this is the four economies over here, again, the ones that are well known for austerity. And we'll see at the end of this, the reason they uh, got chosen for austerity, in some sense pressure put on them from abroad, from the rest of the European Union, uh, Eurozone actually, uh, was that they had uh, relatively high debt ratios that Mark Skousen mentioned as an issue uh, for us as well. But let me go on. Take a look at this. Um, this is what's happening in our economy and in the United States. Actually, we've had a very modest stimulation program. The Obama program was kept under a trillion, but uh, most economists, who in some sense were sort of using the best estimate they could to say what would in fact really push us towards recovery, it would have been something double or more the size of the stimulus program. It was about $850 billion, including tax cuts, uh, transfers to states, so for a couple of years states didn't have to lay off teachers and police, um, and then some other uh, stimulating uh, projects. Um, but in any case, uh, what you see here is uh, per capita disposable income for the U.S. in real terms at the bottom line, has basically um, sort of fluctuated around here. This is the uh, per capita disposable income, so it's kind of funny, uh, all those years, it hasn't really been such a big uh, advance for the U.S. Um, but uh, net worth, what you can see is in this uh, great recession, that the net worth of the average household has been almost halved, and that's partly because the average household, let's say the median household, only had about $110,000, $20,000 net worth. And so most of the people had that invested in their houses when the houses took a flat, a, a chop. Basically, they lost uh, half of their net worth, uh, mainly in their house. But let me uh, go on here because there's not enough time to really go through all of this. Um, I'm going to go uh, actually towards the end here if I can. Just tell a couple things. A couple of things.
Anyway, uh, in, in Europe, uh, one of the things that's very interesting is we've had a kind of a natural experiment. You've had the U.S., surprisingly, we've complained a lot about what the government's done, but actually uh, our, of the biggest economies, has been one of the few where you've had real uh, attempt to actually stimulate the economy as it's uh, declined 2008-2009. Uh, in Europe, uh, there was not so much of that. And, uh, and actually for a series of economies, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, and Spain, sometimes some people just like to call them pigs because of their initials. But in the literature now, they're referred to as the gips. Okay, Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain. Uh, to make it so you're not uh, using uh, language that Mark doesn't want us to use to uh, call them bad things. And what we see here is, what is this uh, measuring? It's measuring the spread compared to Germany, which is in some sense, if you're in Europe, it's something like the U.S. Treasury bond, the rates at which the government pays on its debt or for uh, borrowing money. And so in some sense, the spreads are above the German rate here, relative to the German rate as kind of a platform, just like the U.S. Treasury operates as the so-called risk-free asset at the bottom of bond uh, markets. Uh, Germany has some sense a similar role uh, in Western Europe uh, at least at the moment. And what you see is that uh, on this part here, um, this is the degree to which they had to take the austerity medicine and actual policies were carried out. So it's a measure created by the Financial Times, I believe it is, as to how much austerity you had to have and then to some extent your differentiation of your government borrowing rate from the German rate. So in some sense, you have to pay more for your debt. That means everybody thinks you're a bad risk, a really bad risk. And if you're a really bad risk, then the Germans want you to engage in much more, uh, let's say, uh, austerity types of policies to bring your budget back into balance. So in fact, Germany is advocating, was advocating under Prime Minister Merkel, something like Professor Skousen was arguing for. Uh, but anyway, why did they get chosen? In part because they were having these problems with the, uh, if we go down here, I couldn't read this thing on the left, I'm trying to figure out what this is. Oh yeah, okay, so this is the change in the spread. So this is in some sense the change, uh, starting up there at zero, getting negative, meaning that to some extent the spread is shrinking as you're going down this direction. And here's the change in the debt to GDP ratio. And one of the strange things you find is uh, you engage in more austerity as you come down here. Okay, you've got a slope, you, a slope to this linear um, estimator right there. It says um, as you, in some sense here, reduce the spread, you're also going to have an increase in your debt to GDP ratio. So as you get more like Germany, in some sense, people have more confidence in you. You're actually ending up in a worse situation, a higher debt to uh, the uh, denominator here, the debt ratio. And that's uh, why a guy who put together these figures, a guy named De Broglie, a, a, a Dutch economist, who's done some of this stuff that uh, has gotten a lot of attention in these charts. Similar types of things on the left here, you've got the uh, GDP growth. <laughs> do I need a microphone? Yeah. I don't really need one, do I? I don't think so. Uh, so, hi. Um, I guess one way to approach this is to, uh, to ask about this recovery that, that many people suggest we are sort of trying to be in. Um, trying to be in a recovery, it's a sort of a mini recovery, it's not much of a recovery. Uh, apparently for, for many people it's a, a not a recovery at all. You sure I don't need a mic? Yeah. Okay, sure. you guys can hear me way back there? Yeah. Um, in fact, the latest figures seem to show that it's a recovery for the top 1%. Remember the 1% versus the 99%? Remember that? Year ago was it? Mm, living it. Ago. Remember. remember one versus ninety nine? Oh, yeah, Joe, you remember that? I got my Occupy bumper sticker on my car out there. We can see it on your way out. I have my one percent sticker. I know. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I'm sure yours is a 
one half of one. I'm selling that sticker to both of you. Anyway, that top 1% is the one that's got all the growth in the last year, apparently. The bottom 99% hasn't had any. So as the economy's grown 1% or 2%, as you explained, um, Professor Scouse, I appreciate you pointing out that we've had some real growth problems lately because that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> that 1% or 2 percent's all been the top 1% growing. The bottom 99% hasn't grown. It's shrunk. I don't know if you want to call that growth or not. The economy growing? I don't know if that's really the economy growing. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I do appreciate a lot of what uh, Professor Skousen has uh, uh, you know, said in the beginning there. Secular slow growth in the U.S. is really a um, primary issue for me tonight. High unemployment, discouraged workers, primary issue for me tonight. Um, welfare, <clears throat> yes, there are way too many people on welfare, no question about it. Um, whether it's destructive or not, that's where perhaps Professor Scouser and I would part company. But inequality is a very serious problem. We agree. <clears throat> Debt and the unfunded liability of Social Security and Medicare, I wouldn't put those in the same sentence. <clears throat> uh, and on the subject of debt, well, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, as for business solving problems, I think it's important to bear in mind that business solves really, really well certain kinds of problems. It does them really, really well. It solves private problems. It doesn't solve public problems in a public way. You hand a public problem to a business and it will solve it in a private way. If you want a public problem solved in a public way, you better leave it to the public. That's how that has to work. My um, philosophical preface, I guess, to what I'm going to talk about here. Um, the main thing I want to get to is this. I, I would tell a diff completely different story about many of the problems that Professor Skousen raised, although quite in sympathy with, with um, a lot of the stuff that he, that he talked about, the need for simplification in an increasingly bewilderingly complex system, my God, it's awesome. It's just awful. Um, but I would tell a different story. Um, and it's not about the deficit and the debt. And um, in a sense, it's not even really about austerity. Um, I think, yeah, we do need austerity. But I'll be blunt right from the start. I think the kind of austerity we need is for the rich to practice some. I think we need austerity for the rich. How does that sound as a motto for your bumper sticker? Austerity for the rich. So, I think we need. so let me explain. Um, <clears throat> right now, almost one in six uh, people live in families that are in poverty. We have about six million people that are homeless in this country right now, about six million. Read an article recently published by a person who was a pastry chef for Panera's. Some of y'all might have read that. <clears throat> pastry chef? Doesn't sound like much to you, maybe, but a pastry chef has to go through three months <clears throat> of uh, explicit training on, on cooking, on, on you know, putting together pastries. You need a Panera's, you're eating some good stuff, and that's because they're well trained. Three months of training, and then another three months of on the job training. That's six months of training altogether. And that pastry chef runs 10 to 15 an hour. I think that's being overpaid. 10 to 15 an hour is what 10 years ago we used to consider barely a living <coughs> wage, a living wage. Okay? 10 to 15 an hour for a pastry chef after six months training. I don't know about that. Meanwhile, up at the top, among the top 100 corporate CEOs, they're getting 380 times, 380 times what the average worker is receiving. 380 times what the average workers are receiving in their firms today. Back in 1980, they were only getting 42 times what the average worker was receiving. 42 times. And they were getting along okay. They didn't complain about it. They weren't impoverished, I don't think. 42 times what their average worker was getting. Not 42 times what the bottom worker <coughs> was getting. 42 times what the average worker was getting. And the CEO was fine. Now they get 380 times what the average worker are they complaining? Yes, they are. Their taxes are too high, etc., etc., and so forth. <clears throat> I think we have a problem. I think the rich need to practice some austerity. 
Are we the most unequal country in the world quite yet? Not quite yet, but we're getting there. By the end of uh, Obama's presidency in a few years, we probably will be there at the rate we're going. There's a number called the Gini Ratio, which all the econ students here will probably be familiar with. Many of you will be anyway. Our Gini Ratio is rising. It's headed for the magic 0 0.50 mark. Brazil's, which used to be uh, pointed out as the most unequal country in the world, Brazil, the most unequal economy in the world, used to, used to have a um, <clears throat> Gini ratio of about 0.6 or 0.7 or so. That was pre-Lula. Lula brought it down. Remember what Lula did when he became president of Brazil. Um, among other things, he brought in 40 million new customers into the banking system. They loved that. And he also brought the Gini ratio down, a measure of inequality. And their inequality is now headed down, downward to, toward the 0.50 mark. We're headed upward toward the 0.50 mark. So the U.S. may pass Brazil by the end of the Obama administration in inequality. We may be the most unequal country in the world by the end of the Obama, uh, Obama administration if we continue on our path, the path that we are presently. <clears throat> That's a bad thing. Let me explain to you why. <clears throat> and this is a, a rather unpopular, I think, um, a theory. But it's a theory that, that uh, has credibility among a significant number of economists. Um, this inequality that I'm explaining began um, basically in the mid-1970s. If you look at the, um, the wages, the real wages paid uh, American workers from the end of World War II all the way up through the present, you find a rising line. This is the one that I wanted to show you on the graph. But I don't have the graph now. So pretend there's a graph here. Okay, rising real wages for American workers from the end of World War II, they're going up like that. So, okay, you got me. I'm doing my most, okay. I'm doing a routine here for you. So they're going up like that from World War II. They get to the, the mid-1970s and they stop going up, and they start going flat. They go up and down a little bit. But they're basically flat. Real wages for American workers, flat. Essentially flat from the mid-70s to the present. Why is that? Did they stop becoming more and more productive? Did American workers stop improving their productivity? They, their productivity and growth has continued from that point on, from the mid-1970s all the way up to the present. Labor productivity growth has continued the same as it always had up to that point. You following me here? here? Wages rise, flatten out. How come they're flattening out like that? In fact, as labor productivity grew, um, after World War II, it continued growing for the, for the entire period, all the way up to the present. So there's labor productivity, it's growing like that. <coughs> and here's real wages. They're growing right with it, except to the mid-1970s, they flatten out. And labor productivity continues growing. Okay, this is called, in some circles, the wedge. Okay, you look at here, so you picture this wedge, this is the wedge. Alright, so the wedge begins in the mid-1970s. Everybody up with me? What's the issue with the, with the wedge? <coughs> the issue is workers are producing X real amount of um, product per hour um, from the mid-1970s on, and it's remaining constant. They're producing, excuse me, they're producing, I'm sorry, let me, let me back up. They're producing X real amount of output per hour, and it's increasing. And they're receiving back X, and it's constant. The amount they're producing is rising, the amount they're getting back in the form of wages is constant. You with me? No. They're producing more per hour from that point on than they're getting back. That's a statistical reality. What's happening there? Who's getting that additional output per hour from American workers? Who's getting it? If not American workers. Who's getting it? Government regulation is getting it. I'm sorry? Government regulations. Government regulations getting it? Yes. No, government regulations don't get anything. People get incomes. And the people getting those incomes are not workers. A bunch of baloney. <laughs> baloney, yeah. yeah, okay. I'll eat some after afterwards. Yeah. We'll go out and we'll we'll get some. We're not, right? We'll get some baloney. Right. There's four kinds of incomes. Actually, there's two big kinds. There's labor income and there's non-labor income. So the S, that extra is going to the non-labor income. That's the first sign of increasing inequality that began in the mid-1970s, 
and it's noticeable in all the measures of, of, of inequality. So it begins to rise in the 1970s. And it's still rising. Well, they're reinventing their money to create more jobs. Yeah. the damn government breaks it back in in regulation. I'd like to finish my talk. I'll give you some time in a few minutes if you allow me. Okay? I actually will. Yeah, please don't finish it. I'll be happy to give you some time. So this is, a, this is a problem, not just because it's unfair, it's an economic problem. What is the problem? Stagnant real wages mean stagnant aggregate demand, because consumption drives aggregate demand. Consumption drives it. In a private economy, consumption is the motor for it. Now you can bring in government, that helps, no question about it. Business will, business will invest, and that can help too, but investment cannot stimulate the economy if there's no demand for the goods to be produced with the investment expenditures. Are you with me? Consumption demand is the ultimate motive for the economy. Do I have time, Terry? Am I here? Okay. So consumption is stagnating. Meanwhile, there's a lot of income going up to non-labor income recipients. I won't call them any names, okay? <laughs> Non-labor income recipients are getting a lot of income. Where is that income going? Savings, financial investments, seeking investment outlets, expanding a financial sector that wants to make some money off of all of that extra money that's accumulated. Where does, it, where does the money go? In effect, corporations and businesses are not paying wages, they're lending to their workforce. And that's where the extra consumption demand is coming from. And it's observable. That, that increase in lending is observable. Credit and, and debt and indebtedness of consumers is, is obviously very clear. Consumption debt is, it went up way into the clouds. Financial sector expanded beyond belief and led to the bubble. That bubble was what drove our economy at the end of this expansion phase. <coughs> that bubble drove the economy. It was the only thing driving the economy because you don't have a strong consumption demand. I'm not blaming anything on anybody here. I'm just talking about what happens. And we can talk about the, the fundamental causes of this. They go deeper. They have to do with globalization, with the decline of labor unions, and with some other problems I'd love to get into. But this is what inequality is actually about. In my estimation, the rest of this stuff about debt, the deficit, the government being a problem is all smokescreen designed to distract from the inequality that is a problem here. I think I'm out of time, aren't I? Yes, that was a good word. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
invest in our cities and suburbs, transportation systems. Private sectors are not going to be able to handle that. And then it's a public investment in that. Infrastructure is already falling apart and people are acknowledging it. You know, private business is not going to invest in roads for us um, without public direction at the very least. And so I would say that if anything, you cut the, cut the military budget and then forget the rest, pay for the rest of, of what you need if you really need to cut the deficit with tax increases on the rich. And if anything, increase um, spending on public investments and uh, these other desperately needed uh, directions. Uh, just as a follow-up here, I see three pots of potential money for our deficit and debt. Uh, one is taxes, which you're saying should be geared to this 4%. Um, this uh, issue of Medicare, uh, which is uh, one of the causes of the exploding of debt. Um, I think I just read that uh, the average couple pays about Eight thousand dollars uh, out of their withdrawals, and they're going to uh, command about three hundred eighty thousand dollars worth of benefits. Um, what about Medicare? Cutting Medicare expenditures. Yeah. We need, we need health insurance. You know, we need we need national health insurance of some kind. I think our health system is a mess. I would never have voted for this system. In fact, you know. Back during Clinton's period, there was a true national health care system being suggested and talked about. And other countries have um, much better ones than the one that we're putting online. The one we've got coming up is uh, better than nothing. Um, and Medicare is a part of it. I don't know. I don't know how to resolve that, but to uh, go to the whole system. I don't know which one to do with it. Um, how would you take care of that, Dr. Rock? Um, you pointed out that. Austerity is disruptive to employment, to GDP, and actually uh, it's a kind of a vicious cycle um, that can create more debt or larger debt to GDP ratio. So, how would you take care of that? Uh, can I ask, answer honestly and not pretend to be a mainstream team? Yes, you can do that. Honesty is the best policy. We have something we call tax expenditures, which means uh, taxes that are not collected because we give special breaks. So there's uh, particularly beneficial to uh, Wall Street financial firms and people like Mitt Romney, um, capital gains, and uh, something called carried interest, where you can turn regular income into tax, reduced, reduced tax rate income. So I'd eliminate both of those. The oil depletion allowance for big oil companies, uh, get rid of that. Military expenditure, there's plenty cut there. Um, and then uh, on the tax side, I would advocate a progressive tax system uh, along the lines of the uh, Northwest European welfare states. Uh, steeply progressive. In some sense, the ability of paid by the rich is so much better to pay taxes. I don't know why they complain about uh, them so much, but that's a traditional American right. Uh, with Medicare, uh, I would start with uh, getting rid of the bill which prohibits the United States government from bargaining with drug companies. Uh, under the Bush uh, drug provision, the unfunded uh, expansion of Medicare under George Bush, that the Republicans actually quite a number of them voted for it. Uh, they did not uh, worry about where they pay for this uh, uh, program. And they also included a codicil to the law which uh, makes it uh, illegal for the U.S. government to use its bargaining power to get better prices for the drugs like every other national health system around the world does. <coughs> Savings, um, the pension credit that we get, um, and the um, health, flexible health plan that we get. The tax deductibility. Yeah. Yeah, I would uh, be willing to consider because they tend to benefit the more affluent. 
So if you have a much more expensive uh, health premium that uh, your employer pays for and you pay for in part, or you pay for it all, uh, that's all tax deductible income, so that's not taxed. Uh, the money you spend on that, so you can get rid of those. Uh, what was the third one? The, the health plan and pension plan? You know, yeah, no, we give, uh, we give uh, a break if you uh, set aside money to save for retirement. Um, and when you look at who actually does that, that tends to be the top two-thirds of society. So again, it's a regressive. We have a lot of regressive tax expenditure programs where we give special tax benefits to the people who uh, can take advantage of them, and they tend to be people like me and other people in the top two-thirds of the society rather than the, the bottom of the third. It's going to be a long haul, but I always uh, like to uh, make a joke that uh, it's going to be great because it will give us just one lousy insurance program to complain about together rather than a thousand really lousy insurance programs. I just spent uh, yesterday and today trying to get my son, who's turned 26 and has been kicked off my insurance, and uh, we, he spent six hours on the phone with Blue Cross Blue Shield, speaking about bureaucracies in the private sector, however. Um, five phone calls, two follows up, ex lots of documentation, and I thought, even I was stupid enough to believe that uh, you, know, you couldn't be denied. Well, he was denied because he, he was sick. Um, but then they tell him in a, in a letter, a form letter that says, but we still have a program that you can apply for which we can't deny you from called Go Blue, and it's some program that we now we have to do. Uh, so three days running around bushes trying to figure out for one lousy private and health insurance program, and I've studied comparative health care in my, over my whole lifetime because my dissertation was on Sweden, and they have you know, one of the very best systems. They pay a third less than we do. All of the results are better, virtually every indicator. So once you get to, to some extent, you're all in it together because we all live and we all are mortal. And I see it as simply a means of being in solidarity with my fellow Americans. You meet somebody in the street in Miami, now you'd be able to complain about the same health program if we go to a national health system. Because, uh, you know, there's no perfect system. So in some extent, you're always reforming any system you put in place, always. <coughs> Several questions. Well, with this, um, you know, according to Wagner's law, as society gets wealthier, um, they choose to have more government services, um, more security, food, clothing, and housing. Um, you want uh, well, what you call luxuries. Um, healthcare is one of those luxuries. Um, you made the point that uh, you know government just kind of retards solutions to the problems, and the private market can do a better job. Um, yet, it comes you know for you know, the public good. Um, there's some things you have to admit that the private sector can't provide enough. Defense is one of those. Uh, arguments made. Healthcare is another. Um, would the private market take care of very sick people? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, Ron Paul answered that very, uh, very well, where he said that back in the 60s, he uh, volunteered a certain amount of time. All the doctors did. Now it's free. Now it's uh, everything is uh, whether the government's involved and so forth. So back in the day, there was a lot of charitable work on, on behalf of doctors, and there still are, but not as much as it used to be because the government has now uh, taken over that, uh, that role. Um, I do think that, uh, um, that, look, suppose we had the food care program. Suppose uh, LBJ, in addition to the Medicare program that he pushed through in 65, he decided uh, food care. And so that food stamps, uh, for everyone who was over 65, would get food stamps no matter what. Uh, well, I guarantee
guarantee you everyone who's 65 and older would have food stamps in their pockets and there would be a huge lobby and all the complaints that you're seeing about medical services would then apply to the food industry. Instead of food, and, and yet because government has played only a limited role in food with the food stamp program, which requires means testing, and I'm arguing very strenuously for means testing as a solution to Social Security and Medicare. I mean, is there any reason, does anybody have any reason uh, why uh, Warren Buffett and Bill, we should pay for the medical expenses of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, other than the fact that we should all get together and hug each other? Is that, is that what it's all about? I mean, come on, let's get serious. It, it, this is a huge waste for uh, wealthy people to be all part of this uh, Medicare program. It should have been means tested like food stamps, and, and then it wouldn't be as much as a problem. And unfortunately, food stamps has become a political football as well because our welfare system is, is uh, I think, way too generous. And, uh, and, and I think that, that people are, are becoming fourth generation welfare recipients, and that's, that's not a good situation. Do you think there's an income distribution problem in play? Yes, absolutely. I think that, uh, uh, that Eric actually raised a very important issue about the CEO pay being, well, I don't know if these figures are right, about 380 times what the average corporate worker is, is earning. It certainly has gone up. And of course, one of the reasons is for government intervention. A lot of people are unaware that in 1992, the, in their wisdom, Congress passed a law that said you cannot, as a corporation, deduct and the expense of uh, anything, any compensation to an executive or CEO uh, over a million dollars. Well, guess what got invented by the tax attorneys right after that? Stock options. So it is largely stock options that has created this, uh, this um, major uh, disparity that, that, that Eric is, is talking about in a very real situation. Now again, I'll go back to John Mackey of Whole Foods Market. I'm telling you, conscious capitalism, uh, his approach here at Whole Foods Market is the future of a very positive story about business. And it's being done without any government intervention whatsoever. Mackey is talking about consciously, government or business consciously making a decision. His company does not pay the top executives can earn no more than 19 times, substantially below these figures, 19 times what the average worker gets paid at Whole Foods. It's a very powerful system. By the way, they have a healthcare system that is incredibly successful. Go and talk to any of Whole Foods employees here at a Whole Foods store and they will tell you about their healthcare system. It is, it is private system. Yes, it's a tax deductible program, and I think it should be expanded. Uh, and and uh, all the workers really like it. Uh, they have a wellness program so that they get benefits if they lose weight and take an exercise program and uh, become a part of their wellness center. Um, there are, there are a lot of benefits. It's all being done without any government intervention. And so I would suggest that, uh, that we take a look at the, the, the Mackey uh, conscious capitalism model. I think it's a very powerful model and, and it's, it's the future. It's a new brand of capitalism that uh, I think uh, Eric Schutz and, and, and Charlie Rock and, and Harry, you too, would, would find extremely uh, attractive. Let me just follow that. Down, down the avenue from the Wall Street uh, benefited. Uh, uh, this, this benefit corruption that is going on in our society it is, uh, it is not just welfare uh, corruption, it's also the wealthy. I mean, no, no, the, the corporate, corporate subsidies are uh, outrageous in this country. Nobody's mentioned uh, uh, ethanol, for example. I mean, this whole thing with corn uh, in, in the Midwestern states uh, is deplorable that, uh, what's, uh, what's going on here. And it's causing all kinds of uh, environmental uh, degradation as well. So uh, there, there, you know, there's, there's many examples of this sort of thing going of subsidies. And I'll never forget, just last year I attended the SALT conference, which is in Las Vegas, where all the hedge fund people 
come together, uh, and there were over a thousand of them. And George W. Bush got up and gave a speech. Now, you would think uh, any uh, typical person would realize that George W. Bush is in, in part largely responsible for the financial crisis that occurred in, 19, in 2007, 2008. They gave him a standing ovation. Do you know why they gave him a standing ovation? Because he bailed out Wall Street in a very big way. Where did that TARP money go? That TARP money went to financial institutions in large measure. They did not go to the average worker. They didn't go to, to train uh, uh, workers who, who have low skill levels and, and the people on minimum wage and so forth. None of those people got that kind of TARP money. That all went to the the big waves on Wall Street. So, uh, I mean, I'm part of Wall Street and I talk about it all the time and I'm recommending private equity companies right now because they're doing a lot of smart things. But um, I think it's a major mistake in the fact that there's this wedge. But um, uh, benefits have really improved across the board in business. And you have to include benefits in addition. Very hard to quantify. And they make an attempt but with real CPI uh, but I don't think it does a very good job. I mean, how do you measure this? What's this worth? How many of you have one of these in your hand? Just by a show of hands, how many have one of these? Come on, every hand should go up. A smartphone. All right, so what's it worth? I mean, how do you put a value on that compared to real wages? And look what's happened to the price of these things. I mean, they're practically giving them away. So this thing that you talked about uh, was uh, really invented by government <coughs> spending. I should say investment. Most of them. Uh, man, this much you haven't read Steve Jobs' story, have you? I, 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 I have no A bunch of crap. Well, the computer came out of
So at this point, I'd like to open up uh, questions. Uh, would you like to go first? I would mind. Do you honestly think that C 
sequestration. I liked your, your illustration earlier about using the VDAX. You know, very blunt, just across the board, cut everything is the wisest way to go about it. Especially, and I disagree with you, sir, a lot of R&D actually does really, really, really get developed in defense. That internet thing really, really got developed in dark first. A lot of those advanced technology parts that we find in these little sexy things that we carry around with us, yeah, they were dark projects too. So what I'm saying is that even in times of peace, defense, not military spending, not the war economy, defense still plays a large role. Whether we're talking protection of commerce, freedom of the seas is free for a reason. It's because we got commerce ships and shipping lanes that are flanked by navies. And second, probably the more pressing thing, cybersecurity. I'm not sure if you guys have seen just how rich the internet has become. You're able to get all sorts of rich media streamed to you, and that requires spatter pipes. There are bigger things being done in the standards part of the industry that allows for more vulnerabilities for you to be exposed to and for attackers to take advantage of. And that can create a lopsided effect at a macro level. I cite China. China, our partner in trade, is also looting us through these same communication channels. They are stealing our intellectual property. If our national competitive stance rests on our ability to innovate as a country and we can't keep that intellectual property, I say to you, sir, why would you cut the fence? And if you are going to cut the fence, would you cut it smartly, more precisely, and not with the Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, the title of this presentation was Spending, Investment, Sequestration. And that really, I think, is the issue here. Um, unless you contemplate spending and investment, so you think it's all a waste, then the VDAX approach is fine. But if, if the issue is that you know, some of what government does is really smart stuff, Okay, whether it's on roads, okay, um, defense, and I can keep on going, I won't. You know, food, I, you know, food I safety. Not, I want to make safety. a comment. Let, let, let me finish. Okay. Um, if there are smart investments, okay, that the government can do, uh, then we should be able to play that Okay? If there are no smart decisions, then I guess you would be forced to do something. Cut it off. I would like to see, uh, I actually think that uh, across the board cuts can often be very, very beneficial when companies then have to, and then you, you decide uh, where you want to cut back and so forth. Um, look, there's a lot of defense companies that have private sector contracts and government contracts. Oh, in fact, most defense companies uh, have those kinds of I mean, look at Boeing uh, as just an example. They do a lot of stuff in the government, but they also have a good <coughs> private sector. And uh, good defense companies develop both. And so if the public sector has to cut back, and they have to. Look, us, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it doesn't matter how much we argue here. It's going to happen. Austerity is here. So your company, the CEO, knows that. And they're not going to just sit back and, and, uh, and not t uh, make contingency plans. We cannot continue to live beyond our means, so we have to cut back. Well, there is a third part of it, and it is taxes. And it doesn't have to come from just the rich, it can come from growth. And for growth, we need investment. And is government part of this investment? No. As part of the government's investment, they are implementing quantitative easing. So my question to you is a debate about cuts, the health of the economy, and our future taking on liabilities. Is quantitative easing work?
assets off the balance sheets of uh, banks, financial companies. They started with treasury bonds and then spread the mortgage back securities and student back debt. Um, and the idea was since uh, Bernanke's, the central bank chairman, he's a expert in what happened.
That's the one we look on the balance sheets that are the quarterly statements of these banks. Uh, they've doubled, tripled, quadrupled, and the bank stocks have gone up. They're not lending money to small businesses and getting that going because of this game that the Fed is playing. They made it even worse two months ago by saying, and now we're going to pay interest on cash that's left at the Fed bank, the commercial bank. We're not going to pay you interest. So that's even more of a reason not to loan the money. I, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I think it's a very frustrating situation uh, for, for business to be stuck in that kind of uh, situation. So I don't think it's a good, uh, good uh, program at all that's, that's going on. Yeah, that's been a side effect, the fact that the banks can uh, borrow money from Taking it away from 500 plus senators and giving it to 500 CEOs, and considering that they already have such a high consolidation of power through money, don't you think that 
giving them even more power is actually making our country more unequal, especially if you proposed a flat tax? <laughs> well, uh, you raised some important points. Uh, the flat tax uh, proposal that I would make is to simplify the tax code. So that means get rid of all the deductions and uh, special uh, exemptions and breaks and so forth. Uh, you do keep the personal exemption so that there is some progressivity in it. <coughs> it tops out pretty quickly at 18%. This is the Hong Kong model which, by the way, does have more millionaires uh, per capita than any other country in the world, Hong Kong does, which was just a rock after World War II, not, uh, no consequence. Um, and uh, inequality is not a particularly bad problem in Hong Kong, and in fact, their unemployment rate is quite low. It's under 5%. Uh, they've had very, very few of these financial problems with the rest of the world, because, although I do think they have a real estate problem right now. It's very expensive there. Um, so the flat tax will benefit the rich. I don't deny that. But that's the capitalist system has to, you have to reward somebody, and I say reward the entrepreneurs and so forth, who are the people who hire workers and pay workers. And if you adopt the Mackey model, which is a stakeholder model, so that everybody, you consciously make a decision to help everybody and make sure that they uh, I mean, Whole Foods pays higher wages. Labor unions tried to go in and organize the Whole Foods. And they came in and they said, well, we offer this, and offer this, and offer this, and offer this. And the Whole Foods people said, we do better than that already. Why should we uh, join a union? Uh, and, and their wages were higher and everything. I mean, I think everybody wins. In other words, the flat tax proposal uh, really creates a more efficient, productive economy so that the pie grows bigger. In other words, I, I sometimes think we spend too much time thinking about how to cut up the pie, distribution. Everything's about distribution and about fairness instead of growing the pie, growing the economy, and benefiting all the stakeholders, uh, which is, is the Mackey model. I want to say one other thing because I know we're, we're running out of time. Uh, um, I do have a problem with uh, uh, Charlie's selection of austerity examples because there are some examples of austerity that have done uh, quite well. Canada is one of them, for example. In 1995, uh, they had a major uh, financial crisis. Their dollar, the Canadian dollar, was dropping sharply. Government is percent of GDP, 52%, running very heavy deficits. And they came together as a country across the political spectrum, and they decided to engage in a two-year austerity program. They balanced the budget in two years. They fired, six, they let go 60,000 federal workers in Canada, which was a lot of workers at that time. And by the way, every Keynesian economist in Canada opposed this plan. And yet it turned out to be an incredible every, success. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. Mark. Pretty much. No, the Keynesian economists, uh, the prominent ones, uh, you know, okay. objected to it. Okay, they all objected to it for the aggregate demand arguments and so forth. And it turned out to be very successful. Then they went on an 11-year supply-side tax cut revolution. They even cut their value-added tax, or their national sales tax, their capital gains tax. Their corporate tax is now down to 15 percent. They had no financial crisis in 2008. The Canadian dollar is now equal to the US dollar. Uh, Canada is doing really pretty well. So I would use that as an example of austerity. There are others, including Sweden, Estonia, uh, Mexico. Mexico, do you know that Mexico has an unemployment rate that is only 5.1% 5, 5 right now? This is why immigration is not a problem in the US anymore, because they're all going back to Mexico where there's, there's real jobs. I wish you'd done this at the beginning, Mark, because uh, you're throwing uh, a bunch of... Uh, Which is not going to make us super better. So we have to somehow deal with that. Um, and he's seeing about 1% decrease in government spending. Um, so 5% reduction on $1.3 trillion budget. I think it's fucking doable. Thank you for coming.